Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, April 6th, 2006. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. Well, this week, we talk about growing your own. Well, growing your own hops, that is. I've received several letters asking for this topic. Dave Wills from Fresh Hops will take a few minutes out of a very busy time of year for him to talk us through how to plant our own hops, take care of them, and harvest a bit of homegrown hoppy goodness. In looking at the mailbag for this week, we have a first, our first letter from the country of India. Navin wrote in, asking some questions in connection with his first batch of beer. When I told him he was the first from his country to write to me, Navin said, I am sure I am the first even to brew beer at home in India. There are wine home brewers, but no beer brewers. Uh, He says, I had a tough time organizing all the ingredients. The malt extract came from Delhi. I live in Mumbai, which is about 800 miles away. The hops and yeast came from Northern Brewer in the U.S., shipped via DHL, and the fermenter was custom-made here. All the knowledge uh, came from John Palmer's online book, How to Brew, and your podcasts. Uh, We'll keep you posted on the progress. Well, that's pretty cool. Uh, First of all, it's cool to be associated with John Palmer in that way, and second, it's cool that we're helping the homebrewing hobby Uh, to take root in a place where it hadn't before. So good luck and happy brewing, Navin, and and thanks thanks for writing in. John from Bolton, Massachusetts writes, I don't have a brewing disaster, but a brewing uh uh-oh. John says, if using an immersion wort chiller, make sure your connections are tight. I unfortunately had about a quart to a quart and a half of chilling water leak down my connections and into my boiled wort. He says, it tasted okay, but I didn't want my final beer to be weaker, and I worried about bacterial contamination. Well, I've had that happen uh, too, John. Uh, you got to make sure those connections are uh, are tight. In my case, there was no harm done, but, you know, there is that worry. For our friend in Vancouver, John says, who lost his carboy to a clogged blow-off hose, always use the giant one-and-a-quarter-inch outside diameter hose right into the top two inches of the carboy. Uh, John says, never use those small quarter-inch to half-inch tubes. You're courting disaster, and losing a batch of scotch ale is nearly a crime against humanity. (laughs) And uh, finally, John says, how about a homebrew tips show? I've got a couple. Number one, see above, about the blow-off tube. And number two, if using all grain, put about a pound of uncrushed, torrified wheat, uh, I believe that's puffed wheat, at the very bottom of your mash louder ton, their torrified wheat won't clog up the holes at the bottom like regular two-row barley, making cleaning faster, and it will aid in head retention for your beer. Well, thanks for the tips, John. Brad from College Park, Maryland, writes in on the debate over the no-chill method of brewing, where the wort is left to cool naturally overnight instead of using a wort chiller. Brad says, I thought I would throw in my two cents on letting wort cool overnight, I've done this a few times on purpose for special beers. One in particular is my ginger spiced ale. This beer has approximately four ounces of ginger grated into the beer throughout its 60-minute boil. Plus, it has clove, cinnamon, and nutmeg for other spices. I like to let this cool naturally because the spices mellow and meld together overnight, which adds another level of complexity to the brew. Plus, Brad says, it smells like pumpkin pie. Sounds good. One thing that I am very careful of is the sanitization of the fermenter and airlock. I recommend using a little sanitizer like uh, Iotaphor in the airlock just to be safe if the fermenter starts sucking air back into itself. I also do not recommend using a glass carboy in this fermentation technique because the hot wort may shock the glass and shatter it if you're not careful. Uh, Brad says a plastic pail is preferable. Just to throw it out there, what did the early brewers use to cool their beer? Hmm. May, uh, Brad says, may, maybe this is a, a more historic method of beer making. Well, that's a good, that's a good question. Uh, Brad also says, thanks again for making the All Grain DVD. It gave me the will to go for it, and I've been rewarded with many great beers so far. Well, thanks, Brad. That's nice of you to say. Uh, I'll put a link in the description to this week's episode on basicbrewingradio.com to Brad's site, where he has posted his recipe to his ginger spiced ale. Uh, Just look for Gamma Sigma Ale on Brad's page. 
Glenn in Chantilly, Virginia writes, Love the podcast. Well, thanks, Glenn. I mostly do mead these days, but I've always used the short boil method from Papazian's Joy of Home Brewing. Inspired by your mead episode, I'm planning on trying a parallel boil-no-boil boil batch to see the difference. Well, I'd love to see how that turns out, Glenn. Let me know. And number two, you asked for goofs and bloopers. I've made plenty, but perhaps the most entertaining would be a peach beer I made many years ago. I had already learned the value of a blow-off tube, but the peaches ended up clogging the blow-off tube. When I returned home, I found the ceiling of the kitchen coated in a foul mess along with much of the rest of the room. I had to mop the ceiling, and there's a, and there's a stain you can still see. So, uh, boy, that'll, that'll test the uh, patience of your, of your better half. And uh, Glenn uh, concludes by asking, uh, you or saying, you asked about people who don't use wort chillers. I've never had one, and I used to try heroic means of cooling the wort with little success. These days, I usually just leave the pot. I'm an extract brewer and usually start after the kids are in bed on the stove overnight and carboy it in the morning. If there are deleterious effects from this, my palate is too uncouth to notice. Well, first of all, I thanked Glenn for uh, writing to weigh in on the side of no chill, and I especially thanked him for the opportunity to use deleterious on a sentence, or in a sentence, on the show. <laughs> now, I'm still skeptical on the whole no chill process, but I'm happy to hear from both sides of the issue. I think it's it's probably worth an experiment, you know, whenever I have time. And finally, Lindsay from uh, Jindabyne, I hope I'm saying that properly, Australia wrote in, uh, Lindsay says, I listened to the podcast last night and would like to comment on the no chilling stuff. I've been reading the thread and several others related on the message board. If you remember a couple episodes ago, this whole thing started from someone reading an Australian uh, message board and asking you know, what we thought about the no chill method. Uh, Lindsay says, everyone in the thread is fully aware of the reason why you chill, but I think the point is that there seems to be ways to do a no-chill method and result in no DME. A good example is the fresh wort kits that you get here in Australia. These are excellent quality, and even the best brewers that use them do not seem to pick up any hint of DME. It seems that to get a properly sanitized fresh wort kit, the wort needs to be pulled, put into a container while very hot and then quickly sealed. The fresh wort kits people see are all compressed in on the sides, indicating that the wort went into them when hot and uh, then was allowed to cool. It's very interesting. Uh, Lindsay sent a link to the thread uh, that started this whole discussion, and I'll, I'll put that link in this week's episode description on basicbrewingradio.com. There is a lot to read on that subject uh, in that thread. So thanks to Lindsay for sending that. Now, before we get to Dave Wills, I want to mention that if you like jazz, you may want to take a look at a CD that I have uh, posted uh, for sale in the shop on basicbrewing.com. Our own Steve Wilkes is the drummer playing with uh, Claudia Burson on piano on a CD called My Foolish Heart. Now, I was lucky enough to be at the recording session for this CD. Uh, I shot video uh, at that recording session, and it was wonderful. And you can hear uh, one-minute samples of the tunes uh, that are on the CD in the shop. And uh, I just thought I'd help support Steve, Claudia, and the others who play on the CD by making it available on the shop on basicbrewing.com. Now, on to growing hops. This is an extremely busy time of year for those who sell hop rhizomes, and Dave Wills of Fresh Hops was very kind to take time out of his schedule to talk to us. Dave gives us the scoop on growing hops of our own at home. Dave Wills, welcome to Basic Brewing Radio. It's spring here in Oregon. It's a beautiful day, and uh, it's hop planting season. All right. Well, that's what we want to talk about. First of all, let's get a, a little bit of a background on you, what you do, and what, what's your background with hops, and how long you've been in them, and how'd you get in them, and what do you do now? My background, I'll kind of keep try and keep it somewhat brief, is uh, after experiencing what real beer is all about when I went to Europe when I was 20, I'm now 40 nine as a recently um i uh, came home to a a sad situation of uh not n not really any good hoppy beers like i had uh, found in europe at the time which was 1980 i guess and uh moved here to oregon and enrolled in the school of agriculture at oregon state university started home brewing and uh 
lo and behold, uh, found out that the USDA hop research farm for the whole United States was, uh, at least there's two of them, there's, but one of them is in, is in Corvallis, where Oregon State University is. Um, I went out there to, uh, to meet, the, meet the people and see if I couldn't get a hop plant to grow my own. And uh, that's when I realized that uh, somebody needed to start supplying some good hops to the, to the home brewing market. And uh, so I started um, just, just that in 1982. After I got my degree in agriculture, I started working with local hop growers here in Oregon and Washington and started buying quality hops from them and started uh, packing them and shipping them to home brewers all over the place. And uh, that was uh, almost 24 years ago. So why should home brewers want to grow their own hops at home? Commercial hops are, not, not, not to say that they're bad, but they're, they are mass-produced. And uh, homegrown hops can be, of course, cared for just like homegrown tomatoes versus the, the uh, kind of tomato that you'd buy in the store. So imagine that kind of difference, mm. which is huge. Um, the main difference is not so much the quality of the hop that you can grow, but the way it uh, can be dried you can air dry them versus uh, the commercial hops. Have, there, you know, imagine thousands of pounds of hops coming into a hop farm or a picking facility, and they lay them in a big bed about three feet deep, and then they have a um, heat, natural gas uh, usually, um, is forced, dr- runs into a burner, and usually runs up to about 150 degrees, and then a big squirrel cage fan pumps that hot air up through the bottom of uh, that three-foot bed of hops, and then the, the moisture then is driven out the top of the hop kiln or the hop oast house. And so that's not the op- perfectly optimum way to dry a good aroma hop because the ones on the bottom tend to get a little dry and crispy, and the ones on the top are, you know, a little bit moist. They, they do get kind of uh, all blended together in the end, and everything is good, but, um, but that... that is not what a home brewer is going to end up having to do when he's air drying his hops at, say, 80 degrees in, in the summertime. A lot of the volatile essential oils aren't going to evaporate in the process, and so you're going to get a, a finer, you're just going to preserve more of the essential oils, and, and hopefully those will end up in your glass of beer. So you, you described the commercial way of drying hops. How would you do it at home with your own hops? I'd take a screen off the side of my house and uh, set it up on a couple boxes or sawhorses in my garage in the shade and, you know, lay them in there about, um, oh, four inches, five inches thick, you know, get as many screens as you need so they don't have, aren't there too thick, and then just uh, let them air dry. And you kind of fluff them up with your hands every, every you know, once or twice a day or whatever. And um, that'll, uh, over the course, it all depends on, on the humidity and the, and the temperature that's, that you're you know, attempting to dry the hops in, but it'll uh, it'll it'll dry them. Uh, usually over about three days, I would guess. I don't live in a very humid climate, so it would probably take longer in a lot of the areas like your place. Yeah. So you might actually want to inject <laughs> a little additional heat just to, um, because we're not having to deal with 80% humidity in the summertime. Yeah, we're we're all about the humidity here in Northwest Arkansas. Or yeah, Arkansas uh, I can general. imagine. So so you, so so I'm speaking from Oregon experience where where we don't have anywhere near that kind of humidity. You could put them in an, uh, in an oven even, just uh, crack the door on an oven and set the heat on, say, you know, try and get it at around uh, 100 degrees, 110 degrees, 100, right, right in there, you know, on some on some cookie sheets or something like that. That, that would be one way to do it. Um, um, food dehydrators, lots of people have those now. That's a good, easy way to do it. If you've got a lot of hops, then that's going to take a while, but... Um, that's why screens uh, off the side of your house is what I would suggest, but um, it, it all depends, depends on your humidity. And how do you tell if they're dried to perfection? That's a good question. You want to let them go until the strig, which is the stem that runs down the center of the cone, is dry. And the way you determine that is you take the whole cone and you just bend it. And as long as it's flexing, it's still got too much moisture in it, and then uh, when it actually starts to crack, then you know your hops are dry enough to... Um, they're down to about 10% moisture, and you can then just um, stuff them into some freezer bags and throw them in the freezer, and then they're good for, shoot, a long time. 
Do you need to uh, vacuum pack them? Do you need a, one of those fancy little gadgets that takes the air out of the uh, packages? Um, no. All you got to do is have a little muscle, and uh, you know, stuff them in a in, in a Ziploc bag, and then squash the heck out of it with uh, <laughs> just a little human force, and then uh, then yeah, I suppose at that point you could. Um, Seal it because my vacuum pack, vac- regular Ziploc bags will, they will suck air back in through the Ziploc and not maintain a vacuum all that great. But uh, you, you can just kind of wrap a bunch of. A good way to do it would just be wrap some rubber bands around it to, to keep it uh, compacted. Um, hmm. If you if you have a seal meal or something like that, for sure use that. I'm not uh, saying, but but it's not by any means uh, it's essential that you uh, have one of those to, to be able to, harvest your own hops and keep them in quality shape. So we've kind of skipped right to the end there. We went straight to harvesting, <laughs> and we didn't talk about growing them. Uh, let, let's start back at the beginning. Uh, how do you determine which varieties that you want to grow? And, and you know, does that does where you live have something to do with that? Hops are natively grown between 35 and 55 degrees latitude. So the first thing you want to do is look at your map and see what your latitude is. And if you're between there, which most of the U.S. is, um, down the southern latitudes, or we're kind of below 35, and but that that's a good sign if you're between 35 and 55, because that's the the where the hops flower the best is that day length in the summertime, and then you're 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 looking good, and then they still favor right around where we are, the latitudes up uh, where we're around 45 degrees latitude, because we're right in the middle of that whole range there. And uh, we're not too cold in the winter as you go further up to the 55 or, or too hot and like we are where you're down around the 35, because they actually do prefer a uh, winter dormancy, where they actually can die back and rest for the winter, whereas you're not going to see a whole lot of that in in southern Florida or southern California, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So, so, um, so that has a lot to do it do with it too. But, um, but, so, so that's not to say that your hops won't grow. They just won't grow as good as they do right around the 45 degree latitude. If you take a uh, just a look at a map and look right across 45, in Oregon, Washington, across to um, Montana and Idaho and straight across to New York, and that's uh, historically where all the hops have been grown commercially. They first started off in in New York when they were first brought over um, hundreds of years ago. And then, not to say they just went straight to New York, but that was one of, one of the areas that was first uh, known as a commercial hop growing area up around, especially around Cooperstown. I've never actually been back there, but that's um, what I've been told is uh, that was the main area that started in the East Coast and then Diseases and uh, I believe it was uh, downy mildew um, created a lot of havoc for the growers there. So um, growers kept moving west, and they seemed then they jumped over to Wisconsin, and then they started having the same issues, and then they jumped over all the way to Oregon and Washington, and uh, that's where they've you know stuck. So so those are the best areas you can grow them successfully north and south of there, but um. It's just not going to be as high a yield. So do all hop varieties pretty much uh, perform the same within those boundaries? No. No, there's definitely um, some varieties that are super producers and others that are really low producers no matter where you grow them. Hmm. Um, Saws is a good example. It's uh, it's uh, the most expensive hop. It's uh, It was a wild hop found in Czechoslovakia hundreds of years ago. And it's going to be super low yielding no matter where you grow it. And then there's other varieties uh, like Cascade uh, that seems to be doing well uh, just about everywhere I hear people are trying to grow it. And and everywhere I've I've heard of people trying to grow saws, it doesn't do well. Hmm. So uh, so it's not so much where you live as as it is the variety. And um, there's a lot of, there's, 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 um, information on our website and on the there I have a link to the USDA hop variety description page where they've uh, grown all these hundreds of varieties and they show the actual yield of that variety in, in actually pounds per acre but um, 
but you can compare that to the, all the other different varieties and um, and pretty much tell which ones are, are the strong growers. Cascade, a lot of the high alpha varieties are generally super, are real good producers. Uh, Cascade isn't a high alpha variety, but it is a, a real fairly decent producer. And then it kind of trickles down to a whole bunch of hops that are kind of in the medium yield range, which would include Willamette and the Hallertau hybrids, Mount Hood and Crystal, and and trickle on down to the more land race varieties like Fuggle and Haller Tower and Tetnanger, those are even lower. And then just put um, saws at the bottom of the pile as the, the wimp. That's <laughs> why it gets the most money per pound. And we, we will, uh, I'll, I can put a link to your website in the episode description of uh, this episode on our Basic Brewing Radio site uh, for Great. people to go to. Um, but uh, what, are the, what are the most popular hops that you get orders for? as far as uh, growing at home? Cascade's definitely number one. It's like four times as big as anything. Mm. So, um, and it's, it's, it's mainly because it's, well, it's my number one selling hop to, for people to make beer with as well. So, of course, that's why what I suggest you grow is what you like to make beer with. So, sure. fortunately, fortunately, it's one that um, that um, yields rather well. So, it's, it's right at the top, Cascade. Have you had a lot of uh, requests for Amarillo? I have had requests for Amarillo. Um, at this, this time, it is a trademarked, uh, patented variety grown by one grower in Washington State, and he has not released that variety to anybody. <laughs> and he's going to, as far as I can tell, uh, keep it that way because um, it's uh, nice to be able to have a monopoly on something. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, so he's not, um, he's not releasing it to anybody. So you, you need to develop your own Amarillo or something similar that uh, can catch on like wildfire like that one has, and <laughs> then you'd be Well, sad. that's the trick, though. Yeah, that's t- that would be tough. Uh, that's what's what makes you Amarillo unique is it's unique, and uh, um, I'm, not, uh, I'm, I'm not a hop breeder. Um, I, I, I take what what all the breeders and people have, have come up with and, um, and propagate them and make them available. Now, when people order hops to grow at home, what will they get in the mail? They'll get a rhizome, right? What exactly, what part of the plant is a rhizome? Okay, the rhizome, a a rhizome is defined as a, if you look it up in the dictionary, it'll say a creeping underground stem. And so that means it's not a root, but it looks like a root, but it uh, has little buds on it that will turn into shoots that come out of the ground and turn into the vine or above ground vine. So not not a whole lot of plants actually possess rhizomes. Hops is one, bamboo, Bermuda grass, iris flowers. Um, so there's you know there's there's quite a few plants that do have rhizomes but but obviously not everything has a rhizome. So so that's why when these things will you'll you'll start a plant and then the rhizomes will spread, and then you'll see another shoot pop up, maybe a foot away from the from the main plant that you planted. So you'll know that you'll have a rhizome going from point A to point B underground there, and so that if you were to dig that up, you could uh, get another plant. And that's that's how we prop- propagate them: is we um, dig up those underground rhizomes and cut them off with a sharp knife and um, send them to you. So that way, it's a uh, an exact clone of the uh, parent plant. Ah, so uh, is it possible to grow hops from seeds? Yeah, it sure is. And uh, there's been a number of plants that are, have been developed by seed. Um, hops are um, dioecious, which means that they have a male and female plant. And so what we're what we're selling and what all brewers use is the female plant and the female flower bud. So if you were to have a male plant, it would have a totally different looking flower. It's a little tiny, like a little eighth inch tiny daisy white flower in clusters. Hmm. And um, so it doesn't look anything like the cone that you get for, for brewing. But uh, it would shed the pollen to the female when, when uh, flower when it's um, open to pollination, which is at the very beginning stage of the flowering, which is called the burr stage, where these little white um burrs are, po- are coming out of the flower, and um, that's when, if any pollen were to land on those burrs, 
it would um, pollinate the cone or the, the female, and um, then you would develop a seed inside the cone. Thus, so you would have a seeded hop, and um, that's um, that's that's okay. Um, but that's there's no really brewing value to the seed. So um, in general, males are not planted. In a few cases, there are a few males planted in a few unique varieties um, because it actually gives brings up the weight of the cone, um, much like impregnation does. You know, you get you gain weight, and um, so since the hops are being sold by the pound, they get a little more pounds per acre that way. By the not in addition to the seed weight, the cone actually gets bigger, uh-huh. and so. Uh, but but most brewers now have pretty much requested um, seedless hops because they don't want to have to pay for the extra seed weight and uh, they um, so so now there's not many males planted and uh, that's that's what we use in beer is, is female hops so this this is pretty much the best time of year for planting right it is the only time of planting is in the spring you want to plant them in the spring probably approximately two three weeks prior to your normal last frost in your in your zone depending on where you're at and then i think that's a little late for us now but are we still in the still in the uh the time period that we can oh yeah that's fine you, you, you can still go after that but you just don't want to push it too early mm. because uh the ground will be just too cold and wet and the rhizome would sit there in the cold wet ground and, and it wouldn't be warm enough to germinate to actually start growing so the likelihood of it rotting versus actually growing are increased so so i encourage people not to plant them too early the first year and then um they can be planted safely all the way up to about the end of may and then at that point because we dig these things and when the hops are dormant and we dug most of our stock in february and um it's been in cold storage since then to keep it kind of in suspended animation in cold storage and then it'll 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 stay fine in there for uh, a few months, but by the end of May, um, they want to be in the ground and growing, and uh, they start to lose their viability after that. So, so pretty much anywhere you're at is the end of May. So, where's the best place to plant them, and what's the best method for planting them? Best place to plant them would be in a sunny southern exposure in most in in most situations, unless you're in the deep southern latitudes, where I'd suggest more of a easterly exposure where they could actually get a little bit of, of afternoon shade. Um, they can handle plenty of heat uh, up in Yakima Valley, up in Washington State. It's uh, not uncommon to be uh, 90s and 100s during the hot summer months, so they can handle the heat. Um, but um, humidity is another issue because um, they that can promote some disease issues, um, but it's in general, I would say the south, full sun exposure, but um, with nice, rich soil. Um, I actually think the best place to plant them for most people is right on the south side of their house. Just uh, drive a 16-penny nail into the peak of your house and run a couple, you know, more than one, you know, tw- uh, nails, and then run twine down from uh, the nail down to the um, side of the house, and hopefully you've got some some soil right there on the in front of your house and plant your hop there and let it climb up the string on the south side of the house and let it act as a natural air conditioner for the to get, prevent the sun from beating on, on your house. Ah, and you will need some sort of structure to support the vine. And I was looking at your website, and there are some pictures from uh, that people have sent you, I guess, from, uh, from oh, their yeah, houses. Oh, yeah, all over the country, homegrown hop yards, yeah. Yeah, people, people are kind of innovative with the... Uh, uh, the designs that they come up with with these uh, these structures. Heck yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's any old way you can get them up off the ground uh, will work. It's there's nothing really. Uh, you don't really want to. They can't grow around something real fat diameter like a telephone pole. Um, I think that uh, if I had to pick a number, I'd say four inches is probably uh, um, four inches and less um, would be a reasonable diameter of something to grow it around um most gr- all, all the growers grow them on on the twine which is just a kind of a it's it's kind of the strength of a, like a bailing twine and mm-hmm. it needs to be coarse so so that when the when the hop gets big and heavy 
it doesn't want to slip down the string. So um, if, if the string's kind of coarse, like a, like a jute twine or a bailing twine, then um, that's good because it'll, it'll grasp on there and not want to slip down. You don't want to use something like a wire or a um, slick nylon rope or something like that. How, t- how long will these vines get once they're established? Oh, I've seen them get close to 30 feet tall in optimum mm. conditions. Um, but um, if you just were to if you were to give it, it, shoot, I used to grow them up eight feet tall. So I'd say um, the commercial hop trellises are 18 feet tall. Uh, for most home growers, that that might be you know, unless you've got a two-story house or something like that that you can run a string off of. It, it gets a little unwieldy trying to build a, a trellis that that tall. Um, 12 feet is probably a, a good ballpark number, but um, different different heights. You know, I'd, I'd say at least eight, eight to 30 feet, with 12 feet being a good good ballpark uh, average for a home grower. If you don't want to go vertical, can you go horizontal, say along a fence row, a chain link fence, or something like that? Hops will self train themselves up. As long as they're going, say, above 45 degrees, once they get below 45 degree angle, then they just want to keep shooting straight up. They don't want to turn back down to go wrapping around. So, not that you can't do that, but what if you want to try and, like, say, you've got a situation where you want to run it over over a deck, then you would just have to go out there about every week or ten days and actually wrap the twine around wrap the not the twine the the hop vine around whatever your support structure is so that you can force it to go horizontally but you just have to give it a little assist in nature you have to let it um, grow straight up um, or or, or above 45 degrees and then at the end of the season you've got to keep in mind that 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 vine will die and you've got to get rid of whatever. Oh, yeah, whatever. then you got to deal with all the dead, <laughs> dead uh, stem, for sure. And then pulling that out of a chain-link fence may not be the funnest thing in the world. Yeah, that, w- that, can be, that, that could be a project, for sure. Um, you might as well just light a match and burn it out there, because uh, it, 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 you'll be picking out a lot of stems um, um, during the wintertime there. Um, it, or you can just let it stay there. You know, it all depends on how aesthetic you want it to be there. In, in chain-link, of course, it, it would get all wound through there, and it would be kind of a big rat's nest, for sure. <laughs> that's what, that's the beauty of growing it on a twine, because you can then just cut the twine and and uh, and it's pretty much you know dealt with that way rather than into a, into a into a chain link. That would be a, that would be a bit of a project to get it all out of there in the wintertime if you wanted to, the unsightly dead vine to be gone. So so you you plant your your rhizome and it starts to to shoot. Hopefully, if you've done your job right. Do you keep all the shoots? Do you let them all take off into vines, or what happens then? Yeah, you definitely keep all the shoots the first year um, because you're not going to get too many shoots come up the first year because you're only starting with a small portion of a plant. Um, And then as time goes on, say in your third and fourth year, you'll have numerous shoots coming up out of the the crown, I call it. Um, And at that point, you probably want to start minimizing some of the growth and oh i'd say you want to train up probably about six or ten uh, of the vines coming out of that crown and then pick the six or eight of the ten of the strongest shoots and then just trim back the rest um that's entirely up to you um but that's that's my recommendation um you can kind of experiment and see what works for you Mm -hmm. it all depends on how dense of a if, if you're like some people are more interested in kind of a big dense foliage type of thing, and other people are more interested in, of course, getting optimizing the hop crop. So, if you want to optimize the hop crop, um, I'd say about six, six to eight vines per hill, and then that would be in a kind of a V pattern with the two twine coming down to each hill in a V, and then r- stringing them up to the side of your house or your trellis or whatever um, at the top of this twine. And do you just let them go, or do you do you periodically have to water them? Well, you have to kind of, yeah, do have to train them on to the string mm-hmm. to get them started, and that would be clockwise looking down as the same way, that just or just look and see how the sun follows across the sky, which is clockwise as you're looking down at the ground, and um, that way once they 
because they're going to walk, wrap, want to wrap around the fall of the sun across the sky, and that's cl- then wrap around the string. And then once you get them on there, they just uh, they'll just go and uh, get up to the top of the string. And then if they get to the top and there's still nowhere to go, they'll just bend over and come start flopping around. And uh, that actually isn't such a bad idea because then that stimulates some of the what's what are called side arms, and then off of those. So sidearms is where a lot of the hops are going to be born. Uh-huh. That's why I like to see people not try and go, you know, give it an unlimited growth because sometimes you'll just have one single little spindly hop, whereas if you just say, okay, I'm only going to go, say, 10 or 12 feet, and you, and you get to that point, then the top gets up there and, and can't go any further up, so it bends over, and then that forces those sidearms, and then that's where you're going to get a lot of your hops. Uh, and I would assume... This is a show on homebrewing, so I, w- I would assume that we're interested in getting the most hops <laughs> per plant, so that's good advice. Yeah, you want it to get to the top of whatever you're growing. So if, if you, whatever you put up is too tall and it never reaches the top, then, then lower down your top wire so that, so that you know it gets to the top, then it'll force those side arms. Now, you, you mentioned uh, diseases earlier. What are the diseases and pests that we're going to have to look after? Um, downy mildew, powdery mildew are the two main diseases. Um, I've heard all kinds of people having issues with Japanese beetles in the south. Um, We don't have those here, so I don't really have any experience with those, so um, I'm not sure what to do about those. Mildew can be controlled with um, um, sulfur, copper sprays and sulfur sprays. Um, Hopefully, most of the, the mildew problems are hopefully... Um, going to be hop specific, and hopefully you don't even have those diseases in your neighborhood because there was never any hops grown in your area. But um, you, uh, I'm not sure if there's some crazy fungi that you guys have in Arkansas that would attack hops or not. I've, I've never attempted to grow them there. Um, so it's going to be kind of trial and error as far as the diseases that you're going to have there. The, then the, the, pests, uh, the main pests are... Besides the Japanese beetle I mentioned are um, the hop aphid and spider mites, mm. and uh, those can they can, they can be a problem, but um, they can be also dealt with. It's um, you just got to kind of keep an eye on it and um, and and try and spray for them if, if necessary. There's a I I, I recommend there's um, insecticidal soaps. Uh, that are organic and actually are pretty effective, especially at killing the aphids. And as long as you can get it on, the, the hops are sometimes so big it's a little hard to effectively get them sprayed with the soap. Mm-hmm. But it's um, it it does work if you actually get the soap on on the on the aphid. And we so. we uh, of course have listeners uh, all over this country and uh, in several other countries around the world. So I'm sure there are varying problems uh, <laughs> depending on where people live. Oh, yeah. We definitely yeah. have the Japanese beetles. I've only so. grown them in Oregon, so mm. a lot of people ask me, how can I do it in Florida? And I'm going, um, it's, 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 um, it's, it's I, I've, I've had, had mixed results, and a lot of it has to do with how, how good a soil you have and how good a gardener you are, and, uh, and, that's just just like anything growing growing stuff. It's uh, it takes takes uh, some attention to. Mm-hmm. Now, how do you know when the hops are, are ready to harvest? They're ready when the cones are. It, it, it'll takes it takes a a little bit of experience, and over time that, that you'll be able to develop that feel. That's why I recommend when you first start growing them that uh, if you leave a few cones on there rather than picking every last cone and you can see how they mature and see if they were if you actually maybe picked them up a little sooner or a little too early rather than uh, too late you can kind of get a gauge the uh, the how they ripen uh, but the hops go from kind of a real hard green feel to them and then when you crush them there's not a whole lot of smell to them and then when you crack them open the yellow lupulin inside the cone is uh, pretty much non non-developed at all and that looks like a little a lot of people think that's lu- uh, pollen but that's uh, that's called lupulin it's a golden yellow powder inside the cone that's where all the alpha acid and oil is in the cones and um, that needs to start plumping up you could even kind of look at it with a little magnifying glass and see if it's starting to get nice and fat and plump 
and then you take and crush it with your thumb and finger and rub it real good and, and smell it. And you want to start developing a nice hoppy smell rather than just a, a watery green smell. And uh, they start feeling a lot more papery than wet and green. So it's, it's, that's about the most I can say. You don't want to, if they start getting a little bit of brown tinging on them, that's, uh, that's also a good sign of, uh, of them being ripe, unless it's been real windy. Then that, that can sometimes be windburn too, but uh, mm. that's, uh, it's, it's, it's going to become a, you know, once you, once you grow them for one or two years, you get a good, a good feel for when the optimum time is. And here in Oregon, that's usually, depending on the variety, from August 20th until about September 15th. That's the main harvest season, from the early varieties to the late varieties. So in the beginning of the conversation, we hand, we talked about uh, harvesting and how to dry them, so <laughs> we kind of covered that in the beginning. Uh, what do you think, in your opinion, is the key to success with growing hops? Well, first of all, the number one thing you think about is soil preparation. This is a perennial plant that you're going to probably have there for hundreds of years, and this thing is going to want to grow for you and you want it to grow all over you know you want it to grow 12 14 18 feet tall of course and so if they, if it's going to be able to do that you're going to have to dig a hole um, don't be bashful dig down a couple feet and uh, then with that soil that you've excavated out of the ground mix that with um, lots of organic matter and lo- and what I found to work the best is um, manure and uh, so we, I use a kind of combination of uh, cow manure and chicken manure. We used to use a lot of turkey manure from the local turkey barns because that uh, bird manure has is, is got higher nitrogen, uh, and, and cow manure is not real high nitrogen, but it's got a lot of organic matter. And so the more of that, and I'm talking when you go to whatever, Home Depot or something like that, and you buy a bag of, say, steer manure, that's a good, you know, everyone's seen those sacks. They're only about three bucks. Use about one of those per plant. Mm. And um, so, cause so so you're not just planting a little radish here. Um, so a bag of, of that and then actually then mix in some additional, uh, the chicken manure, those come in a little bit smaller sacks, unless, you're, unless you have your own chickens or whatever. We won't talk about that. Most people are going to be buying sacks of, of chicken manure, I'd say I'd use maybe half a sack uh, to around, around half a sack uh, and a full sack of steer manure per per plant. And, of course, that's going to be more material than you actually, um, you know, you, you, you're, gonna, you're adding a lot of the material right there to each spot, so it's going to mound up a little bit. But that's okay. Just mound it up a little bit. And um, if you look at the Fresh Hops logo at freshhops.com, it has the, a cool logo from the first book ever written on hops in the 1500s, where the uh, the mound is actually up about waist high on these guys. Wow. So it's um, that was the ancient, you know, the old way of uh, adding fertilizer was uh, with lots of manure, and they would just pile it on, of course. And um, so so that's that's important. And then if uh, and and if your soil, of course, is um, is is real acid, you want to add some lime there because um, they want to shoot for a pH of, of about neutral. And um, if you have any, you know, talk to your local nursery and see what your soils are lacking in because that's the time you want to uh, um, amend your soil is when you've got your hole down three feet to, you know, okay, I said three feet, but uh, if you want to go three feet, that's fine too because that's where your roots are ultimately going to go. They're going to mm-hmm. go further, quite, quite, quite deep. So uh, if you, the richer you can make that soil for the plant, the happier it's going to be. Um, then, of course, it, you don't want to drown it with water. You just want to water it with um, the normal amount of water that you would use on pretty much any garden plant. You know, it has to dry out a little bit in, in between waterings and uh, and fair amount of sun, and uh, and it should do just fine for you. Well, great. Well, one more thing I want to talk about before I get you off the phone is this hop madness thing. <laughs> you sent me, uh, or you told me about uh, a link or, or I uh, link to a website that I'll put on uh, this episode uh, as well, but uh, to something a little bit nutty, a little bit fun called uh, Hop Madness at the uh, end of the summer. Yeah, Hop Madness is um, something I started um, for the 20th anniversary of Fresh Hops um, in 2002, and then I was going to only do it one year, but um, everyone had such a fun time, they 
keep wanting us to bring it back. It's um, it's an opportunity for basic, mainly home brewers to uh, come to the Willamette Valley, and that's Willamette as opposed to Willamette. Um, it's uh, it's it's. I'm looking right out the window here at the uh, Willamette River, and that's that runs from north and uh, up from here from Eugene, Oregon, up to about Portland and dumps into the Columbia. And then the whole valley between Eugene and Portland is called the Willamette Valley, and the Willamette hops are, are developed, of course, here. Um, but uh, there's a number of hop growers all through the Willamette Valley, and so we go there right during harvest so that everyone can have an opportunity to see how the big boys do, do their harvest and picking and drying. And so that's really a blast to see how, how that's done and go into the kilns and uh, just get the intense aroma of hops drying. And then uh, there's people diving into piles of hops that are, you know, these piles of hops are oh, probably about 15 feet tall. So people are just diving in there and just uh, having a blast. And uh, it's um, at that point we're, we're, we've done the tour and then we go back to the campground where we are camping and a lot of people, the local people, bring their portable brewing systems, and we make uh, harvest ales. Mm. So we, of course, there's plenty of green hops to be had at that point, so we're, we're picking green hops off of some vines and uh, throwing them right into the kettle. And that's, uh, um, there's, that's kind of a, a new craze over the last, um, I'd say, five years, and, Started, kind of started off, I think, pretty much with um, probably Sierra Nevada and their Harvest Ale. Um, they were they were get, shipping down the um, green hops from Washington down there to make the beer with undried hops. And with the undried hops, you know, I referred earlier to the fact that the essential oils are kind of volatile and they'll uh, they'll you know just boil off in the in the drying process. Of course, with no drying done at all, you've got all of the oils in the hops and those are all going into your beer and you get a very unique hoppy flavor from the fact that you have all of the hop oils in your beer and it's um it's 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 i haven't met too many people that don't like it it is very hoppy um it's not it's not about bitterness at all it's uh, because it's not um these oils don't add bitterness they only add hop flavor and aroma but it's um it's, it's a fun style of beer, and it can only be made, of course, during um, hop harvest time, and I encourage uh, people that are um, growing their own to make their own harvest ale. One thing you got to keep in mind is that uh, when you're using your recipes, uh, your, your, your recipe is based on the hops being dried down to an average of about 9% moisture, and these hops that you're picking are probably going to be around 70% moisture, thereabouts. Hmm. And so the uh, so you're going to probably want to use about six times as much hops as you normally would in your recipe just to compensate for the additional water weight. Really? And because uh, that because that's how much evaporates in the in the drying process. And so uh, so you just ha- so you've got quite a hop soup there with all that water in in the hops, uh, but it's um, it it, it cre- can create a very unique flavor and. Uh, it's 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 not a style that's too commonly available across the country because there's not an, you know hops are only being grown in Oregon, Washington, and Idaho, so it's hard for breweries to get the the wet hops and not not a whole lot are as uh, um, crazy as the Sierra Nevada to have them uh, um, next day trucked down to them so that they can go right into the into the brew the next day and then it can pretty much only can be brewed for those you know couple weeks while the hops are being picked because they can't be really stored at that point they're just like uh, perishable produce at that point so um so it's um that's what hop madness is is a celebration of the hop uh making harvest ales and and seeing how the big boys uh um do their thing and then you can camp out and um um and head home with your carboy bubbling um on the airplane (laughs) (laughs) Well, hopefully that that would be the time for the U-Haul or something. The, yeah, well, like if, if, you can't, if you can't brew, then it's still a fun time to come out and um, and see see everybody, meet everybody out here, and um, and you know just experience Oregon and the uh, and the hop scene. And uh, it's uh, like you say, hopmadness.com. The date hasn't been picked this year. 
for it, but it's usually right around the first week of September, last week of August. It'll be posted at fresh at hotmadness.com here sometime by early summer. Well, it sounds like a blast, and I, I know you're busy this time of year, so I appreciate your taking time out to uh, talk to us, Dave. Yeah, we're hopping. So, uh, yeah, thanks for the call, Jim. Um, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'm going to provide a link off my site to Basic Brewing as well. I've enjoyed a lot of shows you've uh, produced so far, and keep up the good work. Well, thank you, sir. Thanks again to Dave Wills of Fresh Hops. You can find links to freshhops.com. That's F-R-E-S-H-O-P-S, only one H in Fresh Hops, uh, freshhops.com. And to Hop Madness, that's hopmadness.com. At our site, basicbrewingradio.com. Now, just look at uh, look in this week's description uh, on the site, and uh, you can find those links. And I'm looking forward to planting my own hops. I'm getting Cascade and uh, trying my luck at uh, helping them to grow. Well, next week, Kevin DeLang of the Brew Hut and Dry Dock Brewing in uh, Aurora, Colorado, joins us to talk about... Uh, his uh, operations, and to talk about mini-mashing, how to do it, and what it makes it different from just steeping specialty grains with an extract brew. If you have brewing questions, shell suggestions, or just want to say hey, write to james at basicbrewing.com, or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. And while you're on our site, you can check out our online shop where you can find new pricing on our DVDs and a combo deal to save you even more. In Basic Brewing Introduction to Extract Home Brewing, we walk you through the extract brewing process step-by-step from boiling to bottling. And in Basic Brewing Stepping into All Grain, we take you through the all grain process from milling your grain to collecting your wort. You can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order it online. And if your local homebrew store doesn't carry our DVDs, maybe you can suggest that they can contact me to find out how they can. Well, that's all until next week. Until then, thanks for listening. I'm James Spencer, production help for Basic Brewing Radio, and our website is provided by Kelly Dodson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time. So long. (laughs) 